All right, so question one was set theory. Um, two sets, A and B. Three, four, five, six, and one, three, five. So the union is just the set of all things that are in either set. And don't list elements more than once. I didn't take off for that, but I've got a feeling other people might in the future, so. Um, don't list three comma three, right? Use the fact that there's no order to this, so having three listed in there twice is the same as just having a three. So that's the union. The intersection is the set of things that are in both sets. So it can't be a one, it can only be a three and a five. And it can't be the four or the six, because those aren't in B. And then the complement, this is the complement of B and A. It's the set of um, elements in A such that A is not in B. So anything in A that's not also in B, so it can't be three, because that's in B. It could be a four, it can't be a five, it could be a six. So it's the set of four comma six. And then power set of the power set of any set is just a collection of all subsets of that. So if your intersection was this, or if it was something different, um, it always includes the empty set, the set itself, and then each of the subsets. And as a check, it should always be two to whatever the size of the set is, if the set's finite. And then A union B take away B, that's a set of all things in here that are not in B. And so it can't be a one or a three, it can be a four, it can't be a five, and it can be six. That's the same as A take away B. And that's always going to be the case because here we're taking A and we're adding an extra things, but anything that we add here, we're going to throw away when we complement. So that should end up being the same as A complement B. Um, GCD. I think everybody got this perfect. Not everyone. Not everyone? <laughs> Pretty close, I think. Um, so Euclidean algorithm. So that's 104, 208, plus 12. So the GCD of these two numbers are going to be the same as the GCD of this and this. So we again use the Euclidean algorithm. So that's 96 plus 8. So we need the GCD of these numbers, which is also the GCD of these numbers. And since this divides this, the greatest possible divisor of this is itself, and that's in fact a divisor of this. So that's your GCD. It's just four. Conjecture that states every even number can be written as a sum of two primes, that's Goldbach's conjecture. I didn't ask you to prove it. Um, that would have been bonus points. Fermat's little theorem to compute. This number. And remember, Fermat's little theorem says. Any number to the p minus 1 is congruent to 1 mod p, as long as a is not divisible by p. So 11 is a prime number, 37 is a prime number. We're good to go with Fermat's little theorem. And the only thing it tells us is 11 to the 36 is congruent to 1 modulo 37.
but since we can raise 1 to whatever power we want, and it's still just equal to 1, we try to get this into this form, and your first thing is just raise everything to a 10. So 11 to the 360 is congruent to 1. And now we just have to do two multiplications to actually find 11 to the 360 seconds. So one multiplication is times 11, another multiplication is 121. And you use your calculator on that, and that turns out to be 10 more than a multiple of 37. So there's your answer, 10. How many odd primes are there? Most people knew that there was an infinite number. Countable or uncountable? Every prime is an integer. But they're not in order. Yeah, that's what I yeah, there's say. a first prime, there's a second prime, there's a third prime. Absolutely. Uh, so, so the distance between them doesn't matter? In this no, there's no order to them. Huh? The distance between squares changes, but we can still say what's the first square, the second square, the third square. So we can put the primes into an order. Okay, I mean, since there is not any order, so we cannot, we don't know, like, there is between each other, if is there going to be the next one, this one and if you find a formula, the next one is going to be before the other one? We don't know what the nth prime is, but there is an nth prime. I, I don't know what the 10 billionth digit of pi is, but there is a 10 billionth digit, and anybody who does the effort to find it will find the same digit. Yeah, that's right. Right, that's so. what I was thinking. I was thinking along the lines of we can't say the first time is this and then we use this formula, and the next prime is this. This so is true. We couldn't count it because we couldn't go n plus 1 or something. But we can because we can just have that list. Yeah, we could use the sieve of Aristosthenes and a big sheet of paper and eventually list them. Um, and the programs that you write to generate primes, they generate primes in a certain order. They're just very slow about it. So yeah, countably infinite, and if the fact that it's a subset of the integers means it's got to be countable. Now it could be finite, but if it's infinite and it's a subset of the integers, it's in a one-to-one -one correspondence with the integers. All right, and then factorization of a number into positive primes is unique up to, fundament, up to rearrangement of factors. That's the fundamental theorem of arithmetic. It says that 15 equals... 3 times 5, it's also equal to 5 times 3. But other than that rearrangement, that's unique. It's not going to turn out to be, say, 7 times 2 or some other pair of primes. And that's, that's a key fact of prime numbers in the domain of integers that we normally work with. And when you work in other domains, like complex numbers or things that have some irrationals thrown in, you sometimes lose this unique factorization. You can actually break something into a product of two primes two different ways, and that changes things up. Your primes look different. And that's something I mentioned in one person's attempt to prove Fermat's last theorem. They mistakenly assumed that this was always true for all number systems, and in fact it wasn't. And they tried to fix that by inventing new kinds of numbers that would be more prime than the primes that they had. And that led to something called ideal theory. Um, proofs. So um, if it looked like you were on a good track, you only lost five points. These were 15 point problems. If you looked like you were on a good track, you only lost five points. Um, if you didn't get very far down a proof, proof path, I took off 10. Um, so prove product of an irrational irrational not equal to zero is irrational. 
and I suggested a proof by contradiction. So if you think about a square root of 2 times 2, that's probably irrational. Square root of 2 times 17, that's probably irrational. Square root of 2 times 100, do we think that's irrational? So square root of 2 times 100, is it possible that that's a fraction of two things? I got it. Probably not, but maybe it's possible. Because um, I don't know off the top of my head 14.1428 if that's rational or irrational. But if you just kind of think about this particular case, could that be a rational number? What's the problem if that's true? If I can multiply by this, this by something, like an integer, and suddenly have it be a fraction, I can just take that on the bottom, and now I've got my supposed irrational number written as a fraction. And you could try to generalize that. If I multiply by not an integer, but by some fraction, and that leaves me with a fraction, I can turn my supposed irrational number into another fraction. So that's, that's sort of the insight behind how you might do a proof by contradiction. And then it's just a matter of enough hand-waving to convince someone that it's rigorous. Um, so suppose I is irrational, um, X is your X is rational, not equal to zero, and I X is rational. And then you just plug in definitions. So x equals p over q, that's a definition of rational, and q is not equal to zero, that's a premise, sorry, p is not equal to zero, that's a premise, and i times x equals, um, I don't know, m over n, that's the premise that i times x is rational, and the definition of what it means to be rational and then substitute in i times p over q equals m over n, and substitution, cross multiply, and here we get to use the fact that p is not equal to zero, otherwise we can't write this statement, we can't divide by zero, so that's algebra. And the fact that p is not equal to zero, so i equals a over b, a and b are both integers, because the product of m and q is going to be an integer, the product of n and p is going to be an integer, therefore i is rational. And that's a contradiction of the premise that i is irrational. So having reached a contradiction, This cannot be true. X is irrational, X is rational, and I times X is rational. So the only conclusion is that I times X will not be rational. Modular arithmetic. Show that the sum of two evens and an odd is odd. And I said in this case, 
you could use modular arithmetic. I actually wanted you to use modular arithmetic. So if x is even, what can we say that sounds like something modular arithmetic? Arithmetic. Equals zero Same with y, and what about z? And modular arithmetic tells us then that x plus y plus z is congruent to 0 plus 0 plus 1, which is just congruent to 1 mod 2. And if something's congruent to 1 mod 2, that means it's odd. cases I think people were, were pretty close on this. Um, a few details here and there. All right, question five. Logic questions. Let me get my laptop up. And let's jump ahead to question. Question six. All this comes together. So question six is asking about functions. We'll come back to five. So an injective function means basically different points go to different points. versus this kind of situation where two points go to the same point. Okay, that's injective. Surjective means that from somewhere we have a map to every element versus Some points that aren't mapped to. Do you have a question? I was going to say, I'm pretty sure Wikipedia has a really nice picture that describes all the different types. Oh, cool. All right, so f of x equals x. Does this take distinct points to distinct points? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. The mathematical way of saying this is f of x equals f of y if and only if x equals y. Clearly, if x equals y, f of x equals f of y, because they're the same point. <clears throat> but this is also saying that if these function values are the same, it must be that you came from the same point. And the only way that x can equal y is if x equals y. Is this surjective? Absolutely. So for all y, there exists an x such that f of x equals y. I should have domains on there for all y in the range. There exists an x in the domain, etc. But you get the idea. Every point gets mapped to any integer that you can think of. We're working over z for these five functions. Any integer you can think of, f just maps that integer to itself. So there is an x that maps to it. So this is injective. Subjective. How about f of x equals 2x? So does that take distinct points to distinct points? equals f of y, then 2x must equal 2y, and 
so x is equal to y. So that's the definition of injectiveness. Is it surjective? It was a point that's not mapped to 3. There's no x such that f of x equals 3, because we're working over integers. <coughs> x equals absolute x. Is that injective? So, example of two points that match the same thing. One and negative one. One and negative one. So it's not injective. Is it surjective? No. Example of a number that's not mapped. Any negative number? Any negative number. There's no x such that f of x equals negative one. You've got to be really careful about domain versus range. Right? We can put any value of x in that we want, any integer, but the values that we get out are just the ones that are equal to the absolute value of some integer. All right, f of x equals negative x. Distinct values map to distinct values. Yep. And is every integer mapped to by some other integer? Yes, if we want to map to x, we just come from the number negative x. That'll bring us there. All right, and f of x equals 0, is that a function? value to exactly one value. Each value in its domain goes to exactly one value in the range. This takes each value to one value. It happens to be zero all the time. But it's a perfectly fine function. It's actually called the zero function. But it's not injective because not just two numbers, but in fact all numbers go to the same point. So it's about the most uninjective function that you can find. And it's about the most non-surjective function that you can find, because almost nothing gets mapped to just the number zero. So all these other integers are sitting out there, and there's nothing pointing to them. So definitely not surjective. All right, dogs and bacon. So for each of these, I wanted to know if it was true or false, and what the rule of logic was that told you that. So all students in this class understand logic. CJ is a student in this class, therefore CJ understands logic. <coughs> That's, true. That's true. That's just called detachment. Right? If you're a student in this class, then you understand logic. CJ is a student in this class, therefore... CJ understands logic. CJ does not understand logic, by the way. He likes bacon, though. <laughs> but if this were true, then CJ would understand logic. So that's detachment. Every CS major takes this class. Boris is in this class. Therefore, Boris is a CS major. So if you're a CS major, uh, let's say CS major, you take the class. And Boris is taking the class, therefore Boris is a CS major. Does not follow. Right? We could have an art major sitting in this class. So what we're doing here is we're saying the conclusion is true, but we're concluding a fallacy from that. So that's the fallacy of affirming the conclusion. Let's see. And this name refers to the situation, not to the conclusion itself. 
it's easier just to write in your notes. But if you want to memorize these, the, it's a fallacy that comes from a situation where we are affirming the conclusion. It's not saying that the fallacy is that we've concluded this. It's just referring to the setup. So that's affirming the conclusion. Um, if you're a parrot, you like fruit. Marky is not a parrot. Therefore, Marky does not like fruit. True or false? False. We are denying the hypothesis, but that does not mean that we can deny the conclusion. So fallacy, denying the hypothesis. Marky's actually a puppy, but he does like fruit. So the only thing that you could really conclude from that situation is that uh, Marky is not a parent, correct? Correct. Yeah, that's the only statement that you can make about Marky. Yeah, we're actually told Marky's not right. a parrot. But there's nothing else we can conclude from that piece of information, even given that parrots like fruit. Gotcha. Everyone who eats oatmeal is healthy. Lizzie is not healthy. than not O. Because if O were true, we must have H. And we have not H. So this is indirect reason. Lizzie is a blue tongue skink, so she doesn't need oatmeal. She eats fruit. Detachment is and you have H, you don't have anything. Sorry. If you have positive O, yeah. No, yeah. yeah. So if you have O, you can get H from detachment. If you have not H, you can get not O from indirect reasoning. A matrix always has the same number of rows and columns. That's false. You can have n by m. Matrix addition is commutative. Matrix multiplication is not commutative. Um, every matrix has a multiplicative inverse that is false. And you can get that from this fifth question. Every matrix equation can be solved. That is false. And if every matrix had an inverse, you could pre-multiply by that inverse. And find a solution. The reason we can't find a solution is in some sense because not every matrix has an inverse. For example,
since these correspond to systems of equations, there's a system of equations that has no solution. And if I form a matrix equation from that, I'm not going to be able to solve it. And the problem is my matrix A is going to look like this. And that doesn't have an inverse. All right, and then another proof. And this one people were pretty good with. Um, this is using the definition of divisibility. So A divides B. means A divides B. It means there exists an integer such that B equals A times X. And they use K because they used up there. Just a placeholder. So given B, sorry, D divides X and D divides Y. Show that D divides this. So the proof style I saw for most people was really good. Okay, there may have been a final link that was missing in some cases. But I didn't see too many people writing down this as a fact and then reasoning from there, which is great. Okay, that's, that's the main result that I wanted, is that you're not constructing an incorrect proof. And I'd rather have a partial proof than an incorrect proof. Um, so given that D divides X, well, we can use our definition and say D equals um, something times X. Sorry, x equals. And we also know that d divides y, so y equals d times k. And be careful, because these can't be the same k, unless x and y turn out to be exactly the same. So I'm going to label these k1 and k2. And we can't say d divides 3x minus 4y, but we can say things about 3x minus 4y that we know are true. For example, 3x minus 4y equals, and we can substitute, 3d k1 minus 4d k2. And we're trying to show that that thing on the right is divisible by d. And if you stare at it, it should jump out at you that there is a d in each of these terms. So the proofs usually give people trouble, and like I say, I was pretty happy with, with um, most people's proofs. There was a fair amount of nickel and diming that went on, which I didn't really intend, but a few points here, a few points there, and they added up in some cases. So if your grade was lower than you expected or were hoping for, um, I think it's kind of just the details. I mean, there's a lot of material here, so if you forget what a power set is, and you didn't put it on your notes, then you'd lose two points for the power set question. And I think there was a lot of stuff like that, but the general sense I got was that people mostly understand the major themes. So, um, I'm not sure what to say about that, other than Right? I mean, it's an open note test, so going through your notes and maybe trying to organize them in a way so you can have as much information as, as you want, but you can get to it in a reasonable amount of time. Um, 
and reworking some of the homeworks and quizzes using your notes as your only resource um, might help. Just sort of like, oh, here's a Fermat's little theorem. I have that over here. And you can pull it out and, and find something you wrote that helps you remember it. Um, so I know there were some lower grades, and it makes it sound strange for me to say I'm not really worried about where people are in this class. But I think, by and large, I think people are, are probably in pretty good shape in this class. Um, I'm still trying to figure out why maybe some of the grades came out lower than, than I think actually reflects the level of understanding. Um, but anyway, so if you have questions about the material or the grades, definitely come and talk to me. Otherwise, we will continue with induction and counting and other good stuff. Yeah? Um, my only thing is that I'm kind of shaky on doing proofs, so... Is there anything I can read not in the textbook that would help, like, with the basic premise of how to start a proof, and, like, what, or is it just, like, doing them over and over I think over it's over? doing it over and over again, and unfortunately, there's not really a lot of worked out examples where you can check to see if you got the right answer, yeah. because the answer is sort of, you know. Um, but if you want to work on some problems, and there are problems in the text, and then come to me and show them to me. Okay and say, is this the right idea? Right, I'm glad to look at those and work with you on them. Because that's definitely where I lost most of my points here. Was yeah. Like, you know, that, that I got like minus five on each one, and then to hear you say, that means you pretty, pretty much got there. But yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, For me, the best way to uh, try to work through doing proofs was to go back to my old trade notes. Oh, really? Because you okay. have to do a lot of proofs and trade. Cool. Uh, mm -hmm. I didn't get very far in the proofs either, though. <laughs> so okay. I don't know how effective that was, but you got me no, that makes way. sense. Yeah. yeah, you had your hand up. Oh, oh yeah, okay. It's just like things like uh, irrational numbers. Like, mm -hmm. for, like when you're doing proofs with evens and evens and odds, like those are really simple things to work with. You take, okay. You take like an integer, and you either add one or leave it the same. Right. But for like an irrational number, that's a lot harder to like visualize. Sure. Um. And if you do a few irrational number proofs, they become as easy as evens and odds. And then you get a proof on something else, and that looks significantly harder. But if you do that type of question a few times, like maybe a divisibility question a few times, then you start to see how to do that. The goal is after you've gotten past this hurdle for even odd questions, for irrational questions, for divisibility questions, that you start to internalize, how do I take a problem I haven't seen before and put together a proof? And it's the same kind of process each time. It's using what you're given, looking at what you're told, trying to put those things together, and then looking for this leap, right? And there's always like a beginning of the proof that's easy, an end of the proof that's easy. There's usually one point where you need to get from here to here. And that's kind of the trick of, of a lot of these proofs. And getting practice at finding what that leap is, right? That's the thing that you get from doing a lot of these problems. So more proofs, more practice on more proofs will probably help. So we have five minutes left. Um, I want to talk about stamps again, and then I want to finish up recursion um, and induction tomorrow. Um, and then starting Wednesday, we're going to talk about counting, we're going to talk about pigeonhole principle, permutations, combinations, that will set us up for our second programming assignment. So I'll post that up in a few days. And then we'll do that for probably the next two weeks. And then we'll do some Boolean algebra, so we'll go back to 250 stuff. But I want to make sure we, we address that in a, a more formal way. So sum of products, products of sums, identities, all that good sort of stuff. Time pending, we'll talk some about graphs and trees, which will be a subject in 222 data structures. We'll talk about algorithms, analysis of algorithms, types of algorithms, um, performance of algorithms will be something that we'll spend a lot of time on and time permitting, to some degree, correctness of algorithms. How do you take an algorithm and know if it's actually right? 
before you even get to the point of coding it, I'm going to write an algorithm to find the greatest common divisor of two numbers using Euclid's algorithm. Well, Euclid doesn't exist. We haven't met him. So we come up with this algorithm. How do we know that this actually gives you the GCD of two numbers? I tried it 50 times and it always worked, but what about the 51st time? So how do you prove algorithms? How do you know that a bubble sort always works? And we can use induction for a lot of these questions. So once we understand mathematical induction really well, we can use it to actually look at an algorithm and confirm that it's going to do what we think it's going to do in all cases, including the ones that we haven't actually tested. So we'll talk about that. Um, and then towards the end of the course, we'll talk about automata theory. So finite state machines, Turing machines, formal languages, regular expressions, and all of this stuff ties into computer science pretty directly. Regular expressions and things like that, those are 224 topics. We're coming up to those in another week in the 224 course. Um, but there's a mathematical side to them that we won't use in 224, but we will talk about in here. Um, and then that takes us pretty much to the last week of the course. And we'll pick up some extra topics here and there. We'll do a wrap up and so on. So things are moving forward. We're at week six right now. Um, we lose most of a week for Thanksgiving. So making good progress moving forward. So any questions on any of that? So a quick refresher of where we were Thursday, and we'll start with this tomorrow. these two postages available, four cents and five cents. And you've got some quantity of postage, at least 15 cents, that you're trying to meet using those stamps. And we proved inductively that you can always do this by breaking it into cases. Case one, so, Let's say four. All right, so we have a proposition P of N which says you can make N cents of postage out of a combination of four and five cent stamps. So if we assume P of N, and then we want to prove P of N plus one, and there's two cases. Um, look at solution. One, only five cent stamps are in that solution, so no four cent stamps. To get to n plus one, take away three of your five cents and add four four cent stamps. So we lose 15 cents and we gain 16 cents. Total postage goes up by one. Case two. have at least one four cent. So just get rid of that, change it to a five cent, and our postage has gone up by one. So that, with a little more verbiage in the beginning and the end, is a pretty rigorous proof that we can always find a combination of four cent and five cent stamps to give us a postage of n, where n's at least 15. So the question is, how do you figure out what the combination of four cent and five cent stamps is? And could you write a program that you give it a number n and it says 17 four cent stamps and 63 five cent stamps? Well, you yeah. just start at 15 and keep going up one. Yeah, you could start at 15 and keep going up one. Start at 15, you only got five, use this to get to 16. Use this to get to 17, 18, 19, and so on. And you could walk your way up until you get to postage for a million cents. But that's pretty inefficient. But it's really easy to code. There's another way to do it which basically does the same thing. This is what I would call um, bottom-up recursion. And we're going to look at a different version of this also. 
So we'll start with that tomorrow. We'll, we'll look at how we actually code this up, and we'll do it recursively. It'll be a really simple program, really inefficient, but easy to write. Then we'll do Towers of Hanoi. I promise we'll get to it tomorrow. Maybe. All right. Is there any go upper function for meter? Any what? Go upper. Go upper. For? For, for meter grade. 